Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing how nonprofits from across the country are making higher education available for all with Samir Ghatkari, president of the Institute for College Access and Success, Ekaterina Stewart, CEO of College Advising Corps, and Lee Friedman, president and CEO of College Now of Greater Cleveland. So thank you so much all for joining. This is going to be a great discussion. Thank you for having us. So a great way to prosperity is a college education. So college access and graduation is really, really important. And so as, as we're talking about this, I'd like to, uh, to shape this conversation, which we have uh, Samir weigh in, first of all, on a sort of an overarching view, then go to Katrina uh, from the College Advising Corps perspective, and then Lee, get right into what's going on in in, uh, in Greater Cleveland. So, Samir, you want to take it away and give us your assessment of the state of college access, graduation rates, and so on in the United States? Absolutely. Um, so, let me just say a sentence about TICUS. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, think tank that's working at the federal and state level to increase college affordability, accountability, and to restore racial and economic equity to our higher ed system. And um, in our work, we're talking oftentimes to policymakers who are trying to figure out what do we do with the higher education system as a whole? What, what does it take to create opportunity in the higher ed system? And um, ultimately, uh, it remains the case that for an individual student, on average, college pays off. Getting a college certificate or degree is the best path to achieve economic mobility for every individual. But at the same time, we know that we've created too much risk in our system for students and families. Uh, we've created a risk that students will go to college, take on debt, um, and for a variety of reasons, uh, not be able to uh, achieve that, that credential or degree, and they'll have the, the debt without the concomitant payoff. And we, just to put some numbers around that, we have 40 million Americans who have some college, no degree. And about six in 10 people who start a college education will end up getting that degree or certificate. So that leaves a lot of folks for whom we've created risk. The predominant risk, um, there's, there's a, a variety of risks that we see in the system. And certainly one of them uh, that I'll highlight is that there's a risk of fraud and abuse, particularly from for-profit colleges that uh, will create debt and leave students worse off. Um, but I think one of the biggest nexuses of risk is our debt financed higher education system in which we think about a student uh, coming from a family where there's maybe uh, their, their family income is maybe $30,000. Uh, we see that they have to um, take on thousands of dollars of, of debt. They have a college affordability gap, even after accounting for all grant aid, even after accounting for a reasonable work expectation. Um, we see that they have to take on thousands of dollars of debt or find other financing to be able to afford the average two or four year public degree. You know, it's it's such an interesting point, because if college is the way to get into these various fields in which you can change the trajectory of your life, education gives you a lot of ability to self-direct, Katrina you end up, if you take on debt, you then remove that power because you end up becoming a slave to debt financing as opposed to being able to pursue a career. You have to take uh, jobs that will give you money uh, as quickly as possible so that you can keep your head above water. How are you seeing it at the, at the college advising course? Oh, thank you for um, having me here. Um, I just want to start by saying what um, who College Advising Corps is, and we're the largest nonprofit um, service organization that uh, focus on helping students to get into uh, those post-secondary opportunities. So as uh, we see it, uh, of course, we see that um, issue of affordability um, everywhere. So what our advisors do is we they look into what is the best possibility for each student. So we found um, for um, students that have um, no concept of what it means to get into 
um, the de that debt that is um, getting into um, a, a post-secondary opportunity, they come in and with the advisor, um, getting them the all the options available. So we look at each student um, and their circumstances, and we try to match them with the best options they can get in order to not uh, to minimize or not to get into a large debt. Um, that could be sometimes getting into a private school with a full scholarship. It could be going into um, making sure that they fill out the FAFSA application and get all the uh, resources that they can get, getting scholarships, getting into public institutions. It all depends, but we really are focused on getting the students their best option. And and what you're what you're talking about here is is providing um, guidance, particularly for first generation uh, students who whose parents might not be familiar with all the different complexities and all the different choices that are out there. You're talking about finding a path that allows somebody to not only pursue their dreams but also not just be caught up in the pursuit, right? So uh, Samir was talking about the fact that. There are many people who are carrying debt and have partial college educations, but have not yet consummated to a degree. And what you're talking about is helping people navigate through to that. And Lee, um, talk a little bit about College Now Greater Cleveland, because now we're talking about Greater Cleveland. Yeah. We're talking about an actual place where actual citizens are building an actual community. And it's very important to have college graduates come into the workforce how do you help that happen? College Now, it was founded in the mid-60s. I believe we're the oldest college access organization in the country, founded as the Cleveland Scholarship Program. And we've learned much what others have heard, which is that advising at a very young age is what really helps our young people, not coming from a college-going culture, to focus on the steps they need to take to find the right fit for them. Um, you know, Cleveland and some of our inner ring suburbs have extreme um, poverty. The kids don't often see people on a post-secondary path and the advising becomes very important. Uh, we advise about 33,000 people a year. Our budget's about $41 million. And over the course of our history, we've given away about $100 million in scholarships. What we've really tried to do in the last few years is focus on a couple things. Number one, fit. Um, and Ekaterina mentioned that. Is it a welding certificate? Is it a you know PhD in biochemistry or is it something in between? You know, and so we focus on fit and we now have a robust career guidance that's education to career. So we still push everybody to get that post-secondary credential. Um, so that's been a big focus. Make sure they go with a plan. To our conversation earlier about liberal arts colleges, if they're going to go to liberal arts college, make sure there's they know why they're there and what. What is the ROI for them on the other end? So that's one big focus. The second is um, we have recently as a community raised $100 million for a long-term endowment to make sure every kid in the Cleveland schools can get last dollar tuition scholarships at public schools and some private schools around our community in Ohio and other places. Um, that gives kids aspiration because if they believe they can pay for it. They're more likely to take all the steps they need to do to go. So that's been a big focus. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, College Now matches every scholarship recipient with a mentor in our community. Um, it's really an email-based mentoring program, but we've seen the results in terms of retention and completion go up exponentially. So we have about a 93% retention rate, freshman and sophomore, and a 70% on-time completion rate as defined by the federal government, either six years for four year schools or three years for two year schools. Um, and that's exponentially better than most kids coming from Pell eligible homes. The other thing that mentoring program is doing is building social capital for our young people. So uh, students that might wanna work in a not-for-profit all of a sudden at their mentor can connect them to somebody who works in a not-for-profit or an accounting firm or a hospital. And that's really, I think, that is going to be the secret sauce, given the fullness of time. Kids who might not otherwise know how to network and connect, because that's not what their families 
uh, have available to them in that particular way, all of a sudden they can get connections into the business community and that means a whole lot. So those have been our focuses. Um, and, you know, our work is, you know, very hands on, you know, we have, uh, 250 people on the payroll, either doing, um, advising or career advising or, um, the say yes folks do the social service piece. I want to ask you all um, a question about the modality of education. It used to be that when one was educated, one had to be in a classroom and there would be a teacher standing up at, at something called a blackboard, right? And they had something called chalk in their hands and they would lecture at you. Now, with the fullness of time, you had more interactive, you had the Socratic method and so on and so forth that walked into classroom. And then you had all these different study work, study groups and so on. But the big change that has happened is this, is this Zoom, it's it's Teams, it's being able to work remotely. And it's also pre-recorded lessons. And really it's going to come to the point where artificial intelligence is going to be assembling lessons for various topics. Do you all have an opinion? And, and Samir, we're going to start with you since you've been um, um, sitting on the sidelines watching um, wh what has unfolded. Do you have an opinion as to the efficacy of these remote learning mechanisms and particularly inter uh, technology as an intermediated uh, force in education? Sure. Well, let me start by saying, you know, technology uh, is, is neither good nor bad inherently, right? You can implement uh, online education in ways that are good, and some colleges do so. And some colleges implement online education in ways that, that are harmful or don't deliver the outcomes we'd want for students. Uh, one of the things that uh, a few years ago, admittedly before the pandemic, there were some pretty big analyses that were looking at what are the outcomes that we see from online higher education. And the there were some good examples um, that unfortunately didn't save mu too much money, but delivered the supports that students needed had high quality uh, at the time from, this is several years ago, there was an example from the University of North Carolina system. And at the same time, we see, unfortunately, some colleges that spend a lot of money on marketing and very little on instruction. And so there are online degrees that on average don't pay off for students. Um, one of the things that I think is, is kind of a key in understanding the difference between the one and the other is how much um, our college is investing in students in terms of supports, in terms of instruction, how much do we see interaction between instructors and students? And I suspect that's going to continue to be a key in the future if we look to the higher education uh, programs, the college programs that pay off for students, that deliver a good education, that get, get students thinking and ultimately get them across the finish line to a degree. You know, your examples are interesting because your examples of where you seem to have a more positive impression is the interactivity between a person, perhaps mediated by technology, but it's but it's really hands-on, minds-on, and human connection, even if it's intermediated by tech. Katarina, do you find the same thing, that, that it actually works if it's more personal, or does it just not work particularly well? What are, What is your experience? And then, Lee, I'd love you to, to weigh in because... This is all coming, yeah. right? This is not, you know, tech used to be just about putting in the the applications, but now it's going to be the a, a real major mechanism. Katrina, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 tricky because um, the reality is that the human contact is important, um, and that cannot go away. Um, particularly people at the at at the lower income level who might have not had as much access to technology. Right. Right. They might need some help and they might not have the means to buy, you know, their computer and so on. Right. And that that's the, that's the other issue, the accessibility of of the technology. But for those that do access technology, especially in schools, um, on our experience uh, in regards to the advising piece is that we are implementing technology and in-person uh, modalities. So. Our advisors, um, initially, our organization started with the advisors in school um, just as part of the community and being there all the time. 
However, really after the pandemic, we uh, we had to go, everybody had to go online. And uh, at that point, our advisors were key to maintain to to the um, to keeping the communication between what was going in, on in the school and the um, the college application process. They were not. Um, sometimes it was only the advisors that um, the students really really connected better because they had this interaction online. So we have been applying technology. We also, if you're trying to connect with families, sometimes it's really hard to get to them. Um, most people right now, to, uh, nowadays have um, uh, phones that can receive um, a chat box uh, messages and uh, we are implementing that too. So the advisor can spend more time in the one-on-one -on -one with the students to support them. Um, I know that technology is not going away. It's, it's a tool that we really need to use. Um, and so we're looking at ways in which we can maintain that um, personal contact because again, we are, um, we're, we're humans. <laughs> we need that, that um, human contact and we know that that is necessary. We know that many of our students um, eh, really are, are missing that piece, especially those that, that miss it during the pandemic. Um, I think that some of the things that we're doing really, uh, and we encourage that our advisors to do is when they're having these conversations online, that we have the camera on, that we really um, um, talk to each other uh, and see the expression on their faces because that is still is still very important. Um, but we, the, we need to use it. It's, it's the one thing that you cannot replace with a machine is that human contact and the in-person side, right, Lee? Yes. I mean, obviously, all of us had to learn to do, uh, you know, online advising or whatever our business might be when the pandemic hit. You know, we had to do it, you know, on a dime, just like I'm sure all my colleagues here had to. Um, what we know is it does not work as well. Um, we, we offer it, but we highly encourage people to be in person. We have our advisors are now in person. You know, if there's a reason to work remotely, there's been a big snowstorm or, you know, there's something else, we'll do it. Um, but we know the kids do better when we work with them in person. The parents do better. We get more done. They're more motivated. Um, but, you know, we everyone has to work around it. You know, we, you know, I, to my point about building social capital, you know, social skills matter too. And so, all of that is part of sitting down in front of an adult, right? And one-on-one -on -one and having to discuss their future plans and listen back and forth. And I think it's really important. I also wanted to um, make a point. I know you'd asked earlier uh, to Samir about, um, you know, online colleges or whatever. Um, just because I, I probably don't really feel strongly about this. We do not give scholarships out for not for for-profit schools. I am not going to say to you that there's not a good one out there, but we really needed to draw a line in the sand and it's easier to simply draw that line, Pell eligible schools. And that means we know there's been a certain kind of vetting. Um, you know, again, this is not, you know, completely perfect, but uh, we have seen a lot of young people wind up in a very bad position by attending for-profit universities that close, don't finish, take their money, the credits don't train. I mean, the whole ball of wax. And so um, I just wanted to also double down on that point. I wanted to ask you all, since I, since I have this great opportunity uh, about a situation, we were working for a major, one of the top two or three scholarship organizations in the United States. We were doing a search and um, we were running a search for the head of programs. And the programs were all shaped to help recipients of scholarships to graduate. They were programs. They were they were sort of like what, what you do, Lee, and sort of like what you do at Katarina. Um, but it was basically shaped around a particular um, uh, group, of, group of students who received these scholarships. In the middle of the search, we were pretty much at the point where they were going to um, interview uh, candidates. There was a management change. We suspended the search for a little while to give the new person uh, time to come in. And then 
Im immediately the board and the uh, the CEO decided to that they were just going to do scholarships and not going to do the support side. Well, now there are there are real logical reasons to do that. For example, they could partner with with organizations that do the support side, and they can just focus on scholarships. But I wanted to ask you that question about the, and, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll start off with with you, Samir. This this idea of the costliness of the experience, but also the importance of support that is not necessarily going to be provided by colleges to students who need that extra support, because particularly students at the lower income level levels and who are first time attendees in their families, they need ingredients in order to get through the process and find jobs and get, and get launched that their families cannot necessarily provide. Uh, so I'd love you all to comment on this and just, just jump in. I won't, I won't moderate um, on this. Sure. Well, I'll say that I'm, I'm eager to hear from Lee since she runs one of the finest scholarship organizations in the country, but I'll, I'll add in just a tidbit on the TICA side, which is that we run a, a community of practice together with several uh, programs that have demonstrated that they can increase graduation rates. Uh, programs like CUNY ASAP, Project Quest, One Million Degrees, which I'm actually on the board of, um, Stay the Course, um, and uh, Bottom Line. These uh, what, what they have in common is they a focus on uh, uh, intensive student supports, uh, some financial incentives, and helping students coach them to the finish line. And I bring that up because um, ultimately, that you know, those kinds of comprehensive approaches that uh, are what works. That's that's what we see evidence building around. That's what gets more students across the finish line. And so uh, certainly if I were talking to the person from that scholarship organization, I would encourage them to, to package those financial supports together with some of the advising that we're hearing Lee and, um, and College Now talk about it as well as, as well as Ekaterina and College Advising Corps. Yeah, let me just say this. We've... Um we would not go that direction. Um, every piece of evidence, especially post COVID, is that if you do not provide the supports, the students won't finish. We have an affiliated organization that's housed at college now called the Higher Education Compact. And our lead philanthropy has funded positions now at five different universities, including our community college as well. And those people do nothing, but we cohort the students coming out of, you know, Cleveland schools or greater Cleveland schools, depending on the place. And they do nothing but bird dog those kids every day, make sure they're getting their needs met, that if they're running into problems, they're getting solved, that they're not making bad decisions. This is on top of our mentoring program. I mean, we've seen in our community college where the on-time graduation, you know, 15 years ago was a couple percent. Now it's, you know, close to 20%. And, you know, there's other challenges with community college. The way you measure it is kind of strange. So um, what I would say is not knowing the circumstances of that particular situation, we've done exactly the opposite. We've really doubled down on the support services. Katarina, do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, although College Advice and Call really doesn't do that uh, that piece of um, uh, following up the students while they are, um, are enrolling to college. What we do well is we manage that transition period between acceptance and getting into um, a college. And we're partnering with other organizations that do the other piece uh, of uh, supporting uh, the, the students uh, while they're in college. We also, the best, uh, the match and fit is very important for us because especially some of the students that we have that are first generation, uh, low income students, we really need to get them the options of getting into those schools that are going to have that level, that is structure of support. So that best mass, match and fit is very important for us and our advisors are really, really focused on that piece. The other thing is our many of our advisors are themselves first generation. So when you, um, one of the things that is very important is that for the students 
to see themselves in someone that it looks like them, their their near peer. So when uh, a student see themselves in an advisor that is um, is being supported uh, in the process, they really they make that um, that personal connection that it goes farther than just getting into getting them into the um, institution that they're going to pursue the career. So we really um, are focusing on that transition piece um, to getting them really enrolled into that we call it summer melt. That is very, very real. We lose, um, we, we're trying not to lose the students um, in that process. So um, in partnering with organizations that are doing the um, a persistent and completion. So that is the way that our organization managed that process. But it's, again, the, the best match and fed is very, very important. It's so important, it, in particular, when, when we all look at each other and we know that our parents or ourselves were first generation. We got in to a education system. We, we all on this show got into an education system because of support that somebody else provided us, our families. And now we are trying to provide that kind of support to others. It's it, it's what makes the American economy so strong is that we can integrate all these differently talented people, uh, people from different parts of the world with different languages. And and um, you know I I read my grandmother's uh, diaries where she was trying to learn English and she would laboriously listen to the radio and write down the scripts in English sounding out the words so that she could teach herself. Um, but now we have schools and uh, thank goodness for organizations like yours, Samir Godkari, president of the Institute for College Access and Success, and Katrina Stewart, CEO of College Advising Corps. And Lee Friedman, President and CEO of College Now Greater Cleveland, thank you so much for helping our students, our, our students in America, get into college, graduate, and start their own lives and make this country the strong country it ought to be. Thank you.